Well, good morning, Highview Church. It's good to see everyone this morning. I want to especially welcome our guests that are here with us today. As Pastor Tyler mentioned, let me encourage you to fill out one of those connect cards. There should be one in the seat in front of you. And if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn, turn with me to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. And um, if you're new to Highview, and a lot of you are, uh, I want to take this opportunity as we're turning and we're preparing to begin our time in God's Word to explain to you something that we do uh, week in and week out, and some of you may not know why we do it. Um, here in just a moment, uh, we're going to participate in something that has been going on throughout church history for 2,000 years. Um, we're going to participate in the public reading of Scripture. And so what we're going to do is we're going to read a text, okay, the same text that then I am going to expound. I'm going to preach. I'm going to explain. I'm going to teach. We're going to talk about what's there. We're going to talk about how to apply it, okay? The church has been doing this weekly for 2,000 years. So we're a part of this ancient tradition as we do this, okay? I'm going to say something after I read the text, and I've been asked about this. We have a lot of people who are new to Highview. Some of you, maybe this is your first time at Highview. Sometimes uh, it's people who have been here for a little while that ask me why I do this, but I'm, I'm going to say this is the word of the Lord. The reason I'm doing that is twofold. One, I am differentiating between God's word, okay, and the sermon that comes from God's word. My words are not God's words. God's words are inerrant. I can error, for example. They are inspired. The sermon is only inspired insofar as it comes from God's word. So it is a differentiator between God's word and my word. The second aspect of this is it provides us with an opportunity to thank God for the grace that is his revealed word to us. God did not have to reveal himself through his word. So when we, and, and many of you do this, some of you mumble through this, some of you begrudgingly don't do it, some of you rebelliously refuse to do it, whatever it is, when we say this is the word of the Lord, here's what, why we're saying, and then in response, thanks be to God, we're thanking God for the gift that is his word. And so with that, let us hear from God's word, beginning in Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 1. I'm only going to read two verses, verse 1 and verse 2. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, what we know not, teach us. What we have not, give us. And what we are not, kindly make us for your son's sake. Amen. If there's a word that gets misused more than just about any other word in the church vernacular of church world, it may be the word ministry. When someone talks to me about ministry, I think I know what they mean by that word. They are usually referring to vocational ministry, as in, are you in ministry? Being, do you vocationally do this for a living? Or sometimes they use the word slightly differently. They take out the vocational element, as in, you do this for a living every day, and they replace it with active engagement in a particular area of church life, and they call that ministry. For example, they'll say something like, yeah, I used to serve in student ministry as a volunteer, and I did it for years, or I used to serve in group ministry, and I hosted a group in my home for many years, and I understand what they're saying. They're saying that was a time of active engagement for me. That's when I was serving using some gifts I had or some availability I had or whatever it might be. 
But beneath all the semantics, what you will find is that most Christians do not have a biblical definition for ministry. And the chief problem we face is this. We define the word in contemporary Christianity in a far more narrow way than the New Testament ever does. The New Testament is very broad in what it considers ministry. We are very narrow, often. Maybe I could state it this way. Ministry is not something a select few Christians are privileged to do. Ministry is something every Christian is commanded to do. We have a very Roman medieval view of ministry, actually, ironically, in the 21st century church. We see it as a privileged few doing the work. And the rest of us consume the work of that ministry. Friends, that's not biblical Christianity. And I believe Jesus strongly corrects that impulse in today's text. In our text, we're going to see Jesus' vision for the church. And we're going to see that it involves every follower actively making disciples in the unique area you have been equipped and you have been called to do so. In this passage, we're going to be seeing Jesus remind us of some essential truths as we seek to make disciples. And that is the title of this sermon, Essential Truths for Making Disciples. Here's how we're going to break it up. Really, this sermon is one major point with kind of three subheadings underneath it. And the one major point is this, Essential Truths for Disciple Making. Jesus lays out here three truths for us to remember as we make disciples. So let's get right to work. Look with me at Luke chapter 10, verse 1. The text says, After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. I want to draw your attention to the first two words of that verse. Very significant words, actually. After this. Now, one of my goals as the preaching pastor here at Hybe Church, the, the main preaching pastor on Sunday mornings, is to equip you to not only be able to hear God's word, but be able to read it for yourselves the other six days of the week you're not here. So one of my goals as we work ourselves through books of the Bible verse by verse is to try and equip you to be able to read the Bible well. Sunday morning worship services, church should not be the only time you read scripture. And hopefully you're reading your Bible daily. It's still January. You haven't made it to Leviticus yet. Maybe you are still doing it. The faithful few who on this 28th day of January are still in your Bible reading plans for the year. Thanks be to God for you. But We don't want that to be the only time that you read the Bible. And so I want you to be equipped, walk away from these sermons, hopefully equipped to read your Bible better. And I know I kind of harp on this from time to time, but again, there's so many people who are new to Hy-Vee who are here these days. And if you're new to the church, uh, I want you to hear this, but I believe it bears some repeating. Um, One way to understand the passage you're about to read is to make sure you understand the passage you just read. Okay, this means you should look for, as you're reading on your own, you should look for opportunities to ask questions of the text you're reading. So let's do a little exercise here, okay? What question should we ask after reading these first two words of verse one that that say, after this? The correct answer is, after what? After what? Here's why this matters. This is also why I almost always do some kind of brief recap of the previous week's passage when we're doing these books that take forever to complete because Luke is connecting and continuing a theme that he's already began. He is continuing a theme in this verse that he began in the preceding ones. 
He's already established the context, in other words, of this section of Scripture. And when we ignore the context of a passage of Scripture, we will struggle to understand its actual meaning. We already know this. It works this way in conversation. Let me give you an example. If I walk up to you and I say, so, do you want to go or not? Which, in fairness, sounds like something I would say to some of you. It's kind of sometimes how I communicate. Hey, you want to go or not? You would say, huh? Go where? What are you even talking about, Chad? You, you, you would need to know some things, in other words, in order to answer the question I'm asking you. What's lacking from my communication with you in that question? You don't know context. What am I talking about? The lack of context makes, in this case, understanding or answering my question impossible. You know those people who start talking to you and you can tell they're having a conversation that they've already started in their head and they've just invited you into that conversation? I see some of you nudging your spouses. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Where did that come from? You get the idea. I, I feel like out of context preaching works like that. Like, here's the thing. Once you divorce the text from its context, you can make the scripture say whatever you want it to say. I was talking to a pastor who usually preaches topically, and there's, there's nothing inherently evil about preaching topically. You can do it in a faithful, consistent way with scripture. You can do it in a way that's actually degrading the scripture you're trying to preach. But he referenced the scripture, and he said, this is my jump-off point. And I said, shouldn't it be your jump-in point? jump off, like I'm getting off this train, you, you should be getting into that, not out of it, not, not setting up a, a sermon with the pretext of a verse and then jumping out of it. I want you guys to know good preaching from bad preaching, okay? And there's lots of good preaching, not just at Highview Church, and there's lots of bad preaching out there too. I want you to be able to know the difference. Luke is continuing a theme. We're, we're jumping into a conversation that's already been happening, okay? A, a topic that's already been unpacked to some degree. And the section is on discipleship. That's the context. Luke is being very intentional about connecting these two passages together. We divide them up in our English Bibles, of course, with chapter and verse and so on, but, but Luke is just continuing the thought. Last week, we saw, what, what did we see? We saw three would-be disciples engage with Jesus and then walk away or have Jesus walk away from them. And the three would-be characters that considered Jesus but did not follow him was an impulsive comfort addict, a responsible procrastinator, and a past-focused prospect. Each of them had a unique opportunity to follow Jesus as his disciple and each one of them walks away for their own reasons. I'm not going to re-preach that sermon. I will say this, if you missed it, I encourage you to go back and listen to it, especially as we continue forward in the Gospel of Luke. It provides so much for what we're going to be talking about this week and in the weeks ahead. Now here, Luke is connecting what he talked about last week with those stories of the would-be disciples with what we see here today. Last week, if I could kind of summarize it this way, last week was about what happens when we do not follow Jesus this week is about what we must know if we do follow Jesus. And that leads me to our main section, Essential Truths for Disciple Making. Look at verse 1 again. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. Now, um, if this feels like a bit of a replay of something we've already looked at in the Gospel of Luke, there's a reason for it, Okay. This is the second successive chapter in the Gospel of Luke that begins with a sending or a commissioning of disciples. Let me refresh your memory from Luke 9, verses 1 and 2. He called the 12 together. This is not 72. It's 12. And gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. So according, at least to Mark's account... In verse 7 of Mark chapter 6, the 12 were also, also significantly, sent out two by two. 
he called the 12 and began to send them out two by two, and he gave them authority over the unclean spirits. So now in Luke 9, we have the 12 sent out. We know who they are. They're the apostles. They hold a unique office, the apostolic office, unique in all of church history. And now a chapter later, and probably a few months later in the story, Jesus commissions a much larger group of anonymous men. We don't know who these people are. That extends beyond the 12. And what we see taking place is a pretty major transition unfolding in Jesus' ministry. Jesus' Galilean ministry, okay, is ending. A new era of ministry has begun. He has set his face towards Jerusalem. He's on his way to Jerusalem. The journey would take several months to complete as he works his way through Judea, kind of winds his way down through Judea. And now we're entering a section in Luke that will not end until Jesus' ministry on this earth and his earthly life culminates in the passion narrative towards the end of the book. But what we see here is that the closer, don't miss this, the closer Jesus gets to the cross, the more his disciple-making strategy shifts its focus from teaching the crowds to equipping disciples. Specifically, he deploys more and more disciples. He equips them and then he empowers them for ministry. Ministry will not be reserved for just Jesus. It will not be reserved for just the 12. It will extend out. The attention of Luke shifts here a little bit in his earthly ministry from what Jesus does personally to what Jesus does through others. Now, the takeaway for us is pretty clear. I hope it's clear. The closer we get to the end, of our story, the more we must focus on impacting the world for Christ through other people. I don't know about you, but I'm becoming increasingly aware that I have less time left in this life to make disciples than I did 10 years ago or 10 weeks ago. 10 seconds ago. The days, they become weeks, right? And they become months and years. And it stops for no one. And unlike Jesus, we do not know exactly when our time will come to an end. Church, our impact in this life for Christ cannot be about how many disciples you personally can make. We just do not have an infinite amount of time. Our impact for Christ will be ultimately measured long after you're gone by the impact you had on those you disciple. Not only that, those they disciple. We go from the 12 cent in Luke 9 to 70 cent in Luke 10. If you're keeping score at home, that's a 483% increase in the disciple-making team that was going to go, in this case, before Jesus and proclaim the kingdom of God as his ambassadors. Look at verse 1 again. The Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him, 72 others. Now, there's some confusion here about whether Jesus sent 72 or 70. You should know that. The ESV here renders it 72. I actually think 70 is a better translation. And we have manuscript evidence that suggests that 70 is perhaps more accurate as well. I certainly wouldn't call it a hill I'm willing to die on. But the main reason that I suggest that 70 is a better rendering in this case is the number 70 actually has a lot of biblical significance. There are 70 nations that descend from Noah's sons, listed in Genesis 10, sometimes referred to as the table of nations in your Bible. Then you have another significant 
group of 70 that are part of Jacob's family that go down into Egypt in Genesis 46. And and it's almost like Jesus is using this kind of people building, nation building, launching, birthing type language here even in his sending of the 70. Think about it. The 70 descendants of Jacob go down into Egypt. These 70 are sent on a mission into hostile territory. Very similar. There are many more examples, but in most cases, when you see the number 70 in your Bible, you're seeing a symbolism for totality. If seven is completion, 70 means totality. And I think Jesus more than likely has that in mind here. So no matter where you land on 70 or 72 in that conversation, it would appear We are seeing a foreshadowing here of a global sending, if you will, of all disciples that was going to eventually happen in the Great Commission at the end of the book. The idea here is this. Discipleship will be for all people and for all nations. There is a working out in concentric circles from the 12 to the 70 to all of us. Now, what's interesting here is that Jesus takes this large number of disciples and he sends them out in much, much smaller groups. Now, follow me here from a logic standpoint, okay? If you're, if you're going to get as the, the gospel in this case to as many people as possible and to as many towns as possible and you have 70 people, how many teams do you send out? You send 70. You say, you go here and you go here and you go here. Now I reach 70 towns in Judea. 70 villages, 70 places. But Jesus actually decides he's not going to go for maximum impact in that way. So 70 towns don't get an ambassador of Jesus sent to them. 35 do. He cuts his potential impact, theoretically, at least for all of us numbers crunchers, in half. He sends them out two by two, just as he had done for the 12. In that case, six towns get the gospel proclaimed. What's going on here? Well, first and foremost, the sending of two by two. It's well-established Old Testament practice that two people, two or three people, confirm any testimony. Deuteronomy 19, kind of the back half of verse 15 says, only on the evidence of two witnesses or three witnesses shall a charge be established. It was to validate that particular charge or that testimony, if you will. Two witnesses were the minimum requirement needed to validate any message. Now, this is the obvious reason for Jesus sending his disciples, but I think Jesus had another reason in mind also. And that leads me to our first essential truth for making disciples. Here it is the gift of Christian community. If you're going to make disciples, you're going to have to embrace this truth. You cannot do it alone. Just had a conversation with a church planter about this very thing. It's hard enough to make disciples with other people. It's really hard to do all alone. Jesus intentionally limits the number of towns they would be able to reach for a reason. Jesus' sending of these 70 in pairs was not only done in accordance with biblical law, it certainly was, as we saw in Deuteronomy 19, It was also done in accordance with biblical wisdom. Let me read for you from Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm, one warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will be able to withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. 
We see this pattern of two by two play out in the early church. We saw it with Paul and Barnabas in Acts 13. We saw it with Judas, the good one, and Silas in Acts 15. We saw it with Barnabas and Mark in Acts 15. We see it with Paul and Silas in Acts 15. We also see it with Timmy and Erastus in Acts 19. Here's the takeaway. In his sending of the 70, two by two, Jesus chooses sustainability and spiritual health of his disciples over sheer numbers. Oh, that we would hear this, church. Some of you are convinced Lone Ranger Christianity is for you. It's a really nice, neat way of avoiding all of us messed up sinners that might get tangled up in your life. Here's the problem. You're a messed up sinner. And you need other people. You need other disciples to come alongside you. Javi, it's a very helpful reminder. It's a timely reminder for us as we see lots of multiplication happening in our church right now. The number of community expressions in this church, in our community space, so that includes things like D groups and gospel community groups, has more than doubled in the last six months. And we're praying more and more about how, how do we do this in a healthy, sustainable way. We've talked about church planting in the future as a church. That's something that certainly requires a lot of intentionality, a lot of thought. I think Jesus has a lot to say about this. But can I just personally testify to the wisdom of Jesus and the preacher of Ecclesiastes here when I say this? I have seen far more solo disciples flame out than pairs of disciples flame out. Community is a precious gift to the Christian who's laboring to make disciples. I've spent the last decade plus of my life planting a church and then working with countless church planters. I can tell you firsthand, the body count of solo church planters is really high. Really high, like disturbingly high. But when we see two or three go to plant a church together, well, the chances of spiritual burnout, moral failure, church dysfunction in that plant drops dramatically. It's almost as if, like, Jesus knows better than us or something about how to do this. Like, there's a reason this works. Listen, I don't care how gifted you are, how equipped you are, how spiritually mature you are, how passionate you are. The follower of Jesus who walks alone is in a constant state of danger. Highview, I could not have planted Highview Church if God had not paired me with Pastor Josh from the outset. No way. And then in his mercy, God looked at Josh at like 29, me at like 27, and after a couple years said, actually, I better send Pastor Terry too. And when Pastor Terry joined the elder council, our average age jumped from 28 to 48, like overnight. It was amazing. Like our church matured overnight. I can't tell you what a gift Pastor Josh was at the very beginning, continues to be, and Pastor Terry was shortly thereafter. Do you know how easy it is for someone who's making disciples and pouring out their life for Christ in any way, shape, or form, I don't care who you are, pastor or not, you know how easy it is for them to go off the rails? Without some brothers alongside you going, man, you gotta get this in check, you gotta get that in check. How are you doing spiritually? How's your family? How's your wife? How's your kids? Oh, woe to those who go alone. It doesn't work well. Hobby does not exist this morning apart from the gift of Christian community. I can assure you of that. This room is proof that God blesses that. So whether it's in multiplying gospel media groups or D groups or sending out a church plant in the future or sending out missionaries in the future, we should consider not just that Jesus sent, but how Jesus sent. And that leads us to our second essential truth for making disciples, the presence of gospel urgency. Look at the first part of verse two with me. We're going to make it through two whole verses today, Lord willing. First part of verse 2. It says this, He said to them, The harvest is plentiful, 
but the laborers are few. Now, Jesus says things like this several times in the Gospels. I can't tell you how many times I've heard this verse in my life, seriously. I've heard it preached in churches. I've heard it preached at missions conferences. I've heard it taught in evangelism classes in Bible college and seminary. I've heard it used in just about any ministry context that needs more volunteers. Most people that serve in and around ministry, as we like to think about it, use this verse to say, and I'll paraphrase, help! It's the great SOS verse sent out. Jesus' words are used here typically from a position of need. That's my point. They're typically used from a position of need. Oh, look at these white fields and there's nobody that cares about doing anything with them. That's the idea. But here is the problem with reading this verse that way. From this position of neediness, Jesus needs nothing. So flush that thought. That Jesus sitting around just wondering if brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so is ever going to get serious about this make disciples thing because the kingdom of God advancing and eventually coming to this earth is totally dependent on that. What a weak view of Jesus that is. Jesus was the least needy person who ever lived. No, I'm needy, you're needy. And often we project that need onto the only one who has no need. I mean, he's been turning seemingly, think about this. No, no, Jesus has needs, this is from a position to me, Jesus has needs. Okay, he's been turning away seemingly willing disciples left and right. Like over and over. Okay, you don't have to follow me. That's fine. Keeps moving. No worries. I don't think Jesus is in need of anything. This verse is actually not about anything Jesus lacks. It's about what we lack. Urgency. Urgency. The harvest is plentiful. It's another way of saying time is short. Based on the colors of the field, The time for reaping and bringing in is now. Jesus illustrates this sense of urgency in John 4 in some very particular ways when he says something similar to what we read here in Luke 10 in John 4, 35. He says this, do not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest. In other words, don't tell me this is about what's going to be needed or going to happen in the future. No, no. Look, I tell you, Lift up your eyes and see the fields are white for harvest. When a field was white for harvest, the farmer knew the time was running out. And an urgent response was the only proper wise response. Not only is the harvest plentiful, but the laborers are few, he says. Now in the ancient world, this would have been a disaster. Fields ripe for harvest with a labor shortage could mean losing a large percentage of your crop. A farmer, a farmer in this scenario, with fields ripe for harvest and very few laborers, would then, in the ancient world, go into cities and look for any idle labor and say, you come with me, you come with me, you come with me. I've got to get this harvest taken care of. Every single person who heard Jesus talk on that particular day and say that particular thing would have understood the level of urgency required in such a situation. High view. Serious question. Does our urgency as a church to make disciples, to share the gospel, to engage the lost, match the level of urgency Jesus is clearly calling us to here? Let's get more personal than that. If you're a professing Christian here today, um, what is your level of urgency? Do you see the urgent need for discipleship, for example, in our culture? In our homes? Can you at least see that as an urgent issue? 
the people perish from lack of knowledge. Does that bother you? Do you see the urgent need for evangelism among the non-Christians in your life? The ones you actually know. Now, <clears throat> again, I want to be really honest. There's a reason that Christians who make a really big deal out of doctrine and particularly the doctrine of the sovereignty of God tend to have a reputation for low levels of evangelistic energy. Some of it's fair, some of it isn't fair, doesn't really matter to me, but if you can't confess that that has ever been a problem in your life, let me be the first to confess it has been in mine. There have been seasons in my life where I have lacked zeal for evangelism and even discipleship. And let me say this. The problem was not God's sovereignty. The problem was my bad theology. So we're like, what? Run that back? Listen to me really carefully. If your theology is making you less urgent for the gospel to be known, you have a deficient theology. It's not that your view of God's sovereignty is too high. It's far too low. We actually think that evangelism and discipleship is ultimately about whether or not God does this or does that or whatever, sure, okay. But what is your level of urgency? Now, let me say this. You think you have an urgency problem? I'm telling you, you have a theology problem that is enabling an urgency problem. Your view of God's sovereignty, it's not too big. It's small if you have no sense of gospel urgency. But I don't want you to miss this. The sovereignty of God should not make us less urgent it should make us less anxious. You see, one error when we look at texts like this is discounting our responsibility. That, that makes us less urgent. Well, God will save who will save, whatever. That makes us less urgent. But another error that some fall into is discounting God's sovereignty. That makes us more anxious. We actually think that evangelism and discipleship is ultimately about us and how well we can execute it or how well we can argue or persuade. Guys, if I thought anyone, anyone was saved because of a talent I have or don't have, I wouldn't be able to sleep at night. The late J.I. Packer in his classic book, Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God, writes, quote, the temptation is to assert man's responsibility in a way that excludes God from being sovereign or to affirm God's sovereignty in a way that destroys the responsibility of man. We must uphold both biblical truths. Jesus simply will not allow us to destroy one or the other, to work it out in our minds. His ways are above our ways. Jesus is communicating a sense of urgency we should feel about the great need for the gospel in the world and the lack of laborers. And he tells us, yes, God is in control. Thanks be to God for that. We're about to get to that. But we are responsible for our lack of urgency. Jesus says, pray for laborers. In the Greek, that word, egartes. It's one who, quote, effects something or brings about and effect through the exertion of effort, whether mental or physical. So it's someone who is putting in effort in discipleship, putting in effort in evangelism. And Jesus here is describing people willing to serve and sacrifice and suffer if necessary, to see the gospel go forward, to see men and women converted to Christ and made disciples of Christ. And he's telling us there is a massive supply and demand issue here. Think about the way Jesus describes the situation and how we often think about it. We often think, man, there's so many of us poor Christians in the world. We're here to share Jesus. So few people in this cold, spiritually dark world willing to hear it these days. Oh, I long for the good old days, that old time religion of the 1940s. That's a whole nother rabbit trail. Jesus says, 
Actually, the opposite is the case. We, we, we think there's a lack of people willing to hear the gospel. Jesus says there's a lack of people willing to share it. Jesus says there's far more people, don't miss what I just said, willing to hear the gospel than there are people willing to share it. Jesus says there's actually far more opportunities for evangelism and discipleship than there are people willing to seize them. Do not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest. Jesus says the harvest is here. It's right in front of us. The problem, Jesus says, lies ultimately in a lack of urgency in the laborers, not a lack of work to do. My goodness. Consider this first on a global scale. Right now, living on planet Earth, there's 3.4 billion people who have not rejected Jesus only because they've never heard of him. They've never had the opportunity to say, no, thank you. They're unreached, completely unreached. They have no access to the gospel. This is why Highview labors through Pastor Tim's work in Central Asia. That's why we're investing a massive amount of money from our missions budget into Central Asia, one of the hardest to reach places on planet Earth that desperately needs the gospel. The fields are white for harvest. Do not say in four months there will be a harvest. Or consider the tremendous amount of discipleship work needed on a national or local level. High view. Listen, <laughs> the American church is so undiscipled, it does not even know what its fundamental mission is. Don't believe me? According to one recent Barna poll of American Christians, fewer than one in five. actually, say that they've ever heard the Great Commission or know what it means. 17% of Christians do not know we're called to make disciples. The American church isn't making disciples because it's so undiscipled, it doesn't know it's supposed to. What are we doing? In another poll, check this out. Fields of white for harvest actually in places you wouldn't think in your life, among people that you wouldn't think in your life. In another poll, non-Christians in America were asked if they were willing to hear a short gospel presentation. I thought 7%. Well, 70 said yes. Maybe they're all lying. I don't know. Maybe we should find out, you know? Like, How about this? Another 80% said if they were invited to go to church by a Christian friend, they would go with them. I mean, most it's like the easiest kind of entry point into any type of evangelism is just bringing someone to a place where they're going to hear the gospel. Do not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest. Don't miss this church. The demand of the harvest always exceeds the supply of workers, and it's been that way for 2,000 years. And that leads me to our third and final essential for making disciples, and it's the necessity of prayer. Jesus tells us what our urgent response to the ripe harvest of like laborers should be. He says in verse 2, therefore, so in light of what we read in verse 1, fields being ripe for harvest, few laborers, therefore, Pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. The word we translate into two words there, pray earnestly. Interestingly enough, in the Greek, it's just one word. Dethete. It's some translated, this word is beseech. If you read a King James Version, you'll see beseech. But the word literally means it's one word in the Greek, pray earnestly. And it means to passionately plead. There's a word I don't hear a lot. Plead. And I'm thankful. I I grew up in a church with an evangelistic pastor and my grandfather pleading for souls to repent and believe the gospel every single week. Pleading the blood. Plead. I think we need to reintroduce that word to 21st century church vernacular. Plead. 
to passionately plead. There is a desperation Jesus wants us to pray with here. And that desperation is rooted in his compassion for the lost. I don't know about you. I am often indifferent to the lost. It's really hard to stand up here and say. But you know how many missed opportunities, wide open goals I just walk away from all the time? I bet it's not too dissimilar from the ones you walk away from that you don't have time for. Oh yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm often indifferent to the lost, but as a former lost soul, I am thankful Jesus is never indifferent to me. My goodness. Thankful Jesus didn't pass me by, if you will. Jesus tells us we are to plead that the Lord of the harvest will send out laborers into his harvest. Who is the Lord of harvest? Here it is Jesus. So so track with me here. Jesus says, as the Lord of the harvest, to pray to him that he would send workers into the harvest. Did you catch that? You see, it's the Lord of the harvest. Therefore, it belongs to him. The harvest belongs to Jesus. The Lord of the harvest is the one who lives the perfect life you and I have all failed to live. He, he, he lays it down to pay for our sins by the means of his own blood so that whosoever may repent of their sins and trust in him will be gathered in by the Lord of the harvest. And here we have the mystery of prayer in one verse. A pastor from the early 20th century named Evan Roberts, who was instrumental in the Welsh revival of the early 1900s, he said this, quote, God wants a thing done, moves a believer to pray that it may be done, and then God does it in an answer to that prayer. That's how it works. How many of you don't miss this? Prayer is the means by which God accomplishes the very things he ordains. Prayer in that respect is our participation in providence. It's easy to hear a message preached like this and think it's for someone else. The Lord kind of actually convicted me that this wasn't for you guys. This was for me this week. But let's, again, let's make this personal. Do you have a lost family member you want to see come know Christ? I'm not trying to get you to start by caring for people in Central Asia, okay? Let's start with people that you know that will die and go to hell if they were to die today. That's just their stated reality. I believe that as you mature in the Lord and as the Lord does things through the gospel in your own heart, he warms your heart, you begin to care more about the nations. But if you don't care for your son, daughter, spouse, so so let's make it personal. Do do you have a lost friend you you care deeply about? And when you think about their spiritual soul, it, it grieves you? The state, the condition they're in, it grieves you? What about your children? Let's get really personal. You know, all your children professing believers, every single one of them? Well, great, wonderful. You're in the minority. You're in the minority. Not a lot of people can say that. And nothing breaks the heart of a parent more than considering that reality. Do you care for them? Can you be urgent for them, for their sake? Church, how great is the need for discipleship and evangelism in our lives? My goodness. We see the destruction of the family. We see marriages falling apart from lack of discipleship in the home. How can we not be urgent? Do not say. There are yet four months, and then comes the harvest. Charles Spurgeon, he put it this way. He said, patience 
is a virtue, but sometimes decision is the greater one. To wait long is well, but not when the harvest is ripe and ready. Then it will lie upon the ground and rot and so be spoiled. To wait may be well, but not when men are dying, nay, when hell is filling, not when immortal souls are in jeopardy, not when the plague is raging, and we have today to stand between the living and the dead and wave the censer of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that the plague may be stayed. Amen. Listen, that's enough preaching. I think we should pray. So here's what we're going to do. For the next couple minutes, it's going to be silence in the room. If you need to get up and go, that's where your head's at right now. If that's, I'm not, no guilt, no shame, whatever, I get it. I'm just going to give you a couple minutes to pray. And I'm, I'm going to ask you to pray for whoever popped into your head just a few moments ago when I asked you to make this personal. Maybe it's a young child, young son, young daughter. Maybe it's a particular people group somewhere around the world. There's 3.4 billion people. Haven't heard the gospel. Pray for one of them if you know them. Maybe it's a loved one that has drifted away from Christ in some way, shape, or form. Maybe it's a spouse. But would you pray now? And then in just a couple of moments, I'm gonna close our time together in prayer. But would you pray for whoever God put in your heart, in your mind just a few moments ago. Let's do that now. Lord, no matter what comes from today, we can rest knowing that your word has been read, heard, sung, preached, but also that hundreds of people in this room have prayed for someone that doesn't know you. And I'm pleading with you, sovereign King Jesus, that you would send workers into the field, for it is your harvest, you say. That those who do not know of your saving, powerful grace mercy, love expressed so boldly and beautifully on your cross would know that power. Lord, forgive us for our lack of urgency in the wake of such unbelievable need. And may you Charge our spirits, O oh Christ, with a desire to see those precious souls born again. And I ask this in the name of the Lord of that great harvest, the name of Jesus and all God's people said.